It's been a, a whole journey. I think it's taken us, for Romans, it's taken us months and months, but beautiful journey. So today we are starting up a new book. We will be doing an exposition in the book of Acts. So today we are starting up a new book, an exposition in the book of Acts. And uh, please, if you just allow me, allow me to just read some few verses in the book of Acts. So we are talking about the book of Acts, and today we are basically looking at preparation for the global witness. We are preparing ourselves for preparing ourselves as we see it in the book of Acts for what we are calling the global witness. So let's just turn to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, we'll read some few verses in chapter 1. I love reading it, so let's, let's, let's read some few verses. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, he through the Holy Spirit, had been given commandments to the apostles who he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, to, together they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore your kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven uh, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparels, who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go in heaven. And so it continues and it continues even as we are going to look at today. Now, the book of Acts is a very interesting book. It's a very interesting book because, number one, many people have been asking themselves the question, whose act are we looking at in the book of Acts? Because some people think it is more of the act of the Holy Spirit than the act of the apostles. But of course it is attributed to the act of the apostles, which is actually a very interesting move. This book mirrors, and it is in fact very important for us to look at this book this year as a church at AAC Milimani, because it reflects so perfectly our theme for this year, which is to transform, uh, transform to transform. It matches very, very well. It gets in, it links very well. Because the book is built from how the church began, how the church looked like, what I'm calling being transformed, how the Holy Spirit came upon them and, you know, the, the church began in, in Jerusalem. They are being transformed by God and concludes with how the church scatters all through the whole place, influencing and infecting people with the things of God. And that is what I'm calling to transform the world. And so it matches very well what our theme this year. And so it is a perfect, perfect choice that the pastoral team really came up with so that we can do an exposition in the book of Acts. Now the book of Acts, I've said some people call it the Acts of the Apostles. Some people prefer calling Acts of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't really identify an author for itself. But when we look at the way the book has been written, even from verse 1, the Bible says, the former account I made, O Theophilus. That alone tells us that, now the question is, which one is this former account? And of course, you can see that former account when you just flip to look. 
Because Luke is also writing in Luke chapter 1 and he's saying, I'm writing to you the most excellent Theophilus. So we are seeing Theophilus in Luke and we are seeing Theophilus also as the receiver in the book of Acts. And so we can conclude very easily that the book of Acts was actually written by Luke. It is actually his second account after writing the book of Luke. So if you look at uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, he is alluding to the most excellent Theophilus. And here, he's also alluding to Theophilus. That means he's writing these two books. Now, the tradition from the earliest days of the church has been built, of course, since then, that Luke is actually the writer of the book of Acts. Now, Luke was a medical doctor. So you can easily call him Dr. Luke. And I've not said anything. <laughs> but he was a medical doctor. He actually was with Paul all through as the physician for Paul and his companion in missions. And what was the purpose of writing this book? The purpose of writing this book, number one, it is emphasizes the fulfillment of the Great Commission. In fact, you cannot read or study the book of Acts without looking at Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in the whole of the earth. And what is the great commission? Go ye to the whole earth. But the beautiful promise there is I will be with you to the end of the ages. So we see the book of Acts, one of the greatest purpose for the book of Acts is actually, you know, fulfilling the Great Commission. But number two, it sheds light on the gift of the Holy Spirit who empowers, guides, teaches, and serves as our counselor. If you read the book of Acts and misses out to see the power of the Holy Spirit in normal human beings, then you have missed a critical point even as we progress through this book. And number three, it demonstrates the power of the gospel as it spread throughout the world and transformed lives. In fact, we will come to a point that the people or the crowd who heard this gospel will complain and say, these guys are turning this world upside down. That was their complaint. The gospel moved to a point that they were complaining that the guys have come here who are turning the world upside down. So the gospel, and you remember when we were doing the book of um, Romans, why was Paul not ashamed of the gospel? Because it was the power to those who are getting born again. So we are seeing power at work. The power of the gospel is actually at work in this book. Amazing book. So let me just start from the onset. I desire to see the power of the gospel at work. Not only in the book of Acts, but also in my life and also in uh, my surrounding. I desire to see the Holy Spirit work in our lives. As we study the book of Acts, we will see how the Holy Spirit is working in the lives of people. We will see how the Holy Spirit is moving in the lives of these people. So we are seeing, and the book is here, is written to a man called Theophilus. Now that has been uh, a big issue. You know, people are asking, so who is this Theophilus? Uh, now Theophilus, the word Theophilus or the name Theophilus comes from a two Greek word that means God, Theos, and Philos, which means friend of or lover, lover of. So basically, Theophilus means the lover of God. So many people have been thinking about it. So who was this Theophilus? Some people think he's one of those uh, people who lived in uh, what they're calling Alexander the Great. During the time of Alexander the Great, some of the Jews who lived then. Some people also think that maybe they are Roman uh, leaders. Some, he was a Roman leader or a very important person in Rome. And they put they, are, they tag their support to that based on the fact that Paul 
is, uh, Luke is alluding to him as the most excellent Theophilus. Now, that was a title that was given to an important Roman leader of that time. But some people also feel that that is not a name of a person. Maybe Luke was not writing to all lovers of God. So all of you, lovers of God. So all of us are lovers of God. I know that that may have a lot of uh, debate, but it is not the debate that you want to get into. It is the debate you want to leave for theologians. But what thing we know is this person, one, must have been a very good friend of Luke. But number two, he is not a Jew. Because if you look at how Paul is writing, especially in Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, he's writing, I'm writing to you the most excellent Theophilus so that you can be certain about the accounts of Jesus Christ, about the accounts of what has happened. And many people say that the Gospel of Luke is one that is the most orderly uh, and chronologically written gospel out of the four. So he is accounting to this person. Who is this person that we must account for them excellence so that they can know Christ and they can know what religion is all about? This must be someone who is not a Jew. He must have been a Gentile. So he's a friend of Luke, but he's also a Gentile. But friends, before we get into the whole idea of the book of Acts, today, you know, I'm just doing an overview, an introduction. Next week, we are getting into the east of things. But it is beautiful to know that before God starts the work of influencing the world with witnesses by the apostles, it starts by preparing the apostles. Praise the Lord. He starts by preparing them. And God has always prepared his people before assignments. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 5, the Bible says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we may be holy and without blameless before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. God always prepares his people for a mission. There is going to be a big mission in the book of Acts. What some people call the global mission. And in the note that we wrote, if you want to know how global it was, look here. The gospel, the witness started in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is actually the capital center for the Jews. But where is it ending, the book? It's ending in Rome, the headquarter, actually, of the Gentiles. And if you are a good student of what Jew and Gentile is all about, then you know that that is extremely a global outlook of that message. But not only that, it starts when the person who is at the center is Peter. Peter identifies himself as an apostle to the Jews. But where is it ending? It's ending, it's ending with Paul. Paul identifies and glories himself as the apostle to the Gentiles. That tells you the global nature of this call. And so for the global nature or for the global assignment, they must have gone through serious preparation. God always prepares his people. Ephesians 2.10, the Bible says, For we are workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Some version says, which God has prepared beforehand for us to do. So he prepares them. This is what I was saying. Before the act of the apostles, there is the act of the Holy Spirit prepare, preparing them for the act. Before the act of the apostles, there is the act of the Holy Spirit. And three or four things that I want to highlight today in terms of the preparation they were getting. Number one, they were to get a preparation of reaffirming the promise. 
reaffirming the promise. And what was that promise? Look at chapter 1, verse 1 to 5. The Bible says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all the, that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles who he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise, the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for truly John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. They were supposed to have the reaffirmation that God is still keeping his word to bring to them the Holy Spirit who is the enabler. Remember when we were talking about the purpose of this book, one of the critical things about the purpose of this book is to see how the Holy Spirit enables people to be of service. And so they needed that reaffirmation of the Holy Spirit. They needed to know that, you know, the promises that God had made with them is true, is yes, and amen. This journey is too long from Jerusalem to Paul being in prison in Rome, from Elder Peter to Elder Paul, with a lot of things that was happening, this journey was too long, and it needed a preparation of the heart, and that preparation must be a reaffirmation of the promise. Hallelujah. And this is something that we all need, friends. Before we make a journey, before we move an inch, it is comforting to our hearts that God reaffirms to us his promise. He reaffirms to us that he loves us. He reaffirms to us that we are still his children, heirs in his kingdom. And so these people are being prepared by, number one, getting reaffirmation that God's promise still stands and that his promise for the Holy Spirit will be achieved in the lives of his children. Friends, it was not going to be the apostles doing it because they could not do it. It must have been done by the promise. So the apostles must be prepared. And so the introductory chapters in chapter 1, we are just seeing their preparation. Kazi ya kazi itaanza. Very soon, Pastor Kip will be coming here to tell us more about how the church in Jerusalem was happening, you know, Judea. And when we start looking at, you know, Paul's, you know, missionary journeys to the ends of the earth, amazing. Kazi, Kali, wengine wanapigwa, viboko, wanarudi. But now they needed to have been prepared. And one of the preparations is reaffirmation of God's promise. But the second preparation, which is very, very important, is the reorientation on the assignment. Reorientation of the assignment. There is a very big trouble in the entire life of Jesus and his disciples. Jesus met his disciples so many times. He spoke to them. But there is one question that has kept running through the New Testament. I don't know whether you know that question. They kept asking Jesus that question. And the question was, Lord, when are you restoring this kingdom? That was a big question. When are you restoring this kingdom? It was a big question. When they were with Jesus, actually, Luke also alludes to this. Luke alludes to this in the, in the Gospel of Luke. When they were asking Jesus, when are you restoring the kingdom? But surprisingly, the way Luke answers, or the way Luke answers in the Gospel of Luke, where? He answered in the Gospel of Luke and said, it will be soon. So in Acts, now when they ask the same question, 
in art, you know, soon has already passed. So they asked the same question. When are you restoring your kingdom? But why was this an important question for them? You know, when Jesus came, Jesus came when the, the Jew and those who followed uh, Christianity were under torment. They felt like they were not in, on control. They were not in control of everything. In fact, the government and every, every, every bit of leadership, they were not in control. And they saw when Jesus came, to them when Jesus was saying that I'm going to restore my kingdom, what was in their head was not what is in the head of Jesus. What was in their head was that Jesus will establish himself as the president of that time. That is just what was in their head. And maybe elect and appoint Akina Peter, you know, or appoint them as ministers. What was in their head was an earthly kingdom. And surprisingly, this is a question that has not left them even after Jesus resurrected. And even after the ascension. And so when Jesus uh, went to heaven and they looked at Jesus going, here is Peter, and they asked the same, same questions throughout their lives. And the question is, when are you restoring your kingdom? They thought that that was the assignment. That when Jesus is now going, they will be left with the assignment of restoring that earthly kingdom. So Jesus needed to prepare them by reorienting on their assignment. So what is Jesus telling them? Jesus is telling them, let us edit the assignment a little bit. So the assignment, and I really love the way it puts it in the book of Acts, says, you wanted an earthly kingdom, okay? That is what, what was in your mind, okay? Now let me tell you. Number one, it is not about you to know the time. So the question when is misplaced. Let us, we, we are getting to agree. Preparation. Because if we leave you, if I leave you with this question when, tomorrow you will start disturbing Peter. Hey, tuliambiwa ni soon. So Jesus tells them before ascension, Leave about the question when. Put it aside. Now let's deal with another thing, the assignment. And then what is Jesus telling them? There is something that you need to do. You will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Hallelujah. You will be my witnesses. That is the assignment. The assignment is not for you to get guns and get an army and fight and get territories, the assignment that you are going to do in the entire book of Acts is actually be my witnesses. And that forms the basis and the heart of the book of Acts that you will be my witnesses here at home in Jerusalem, my neighbors and your neighbors in Judea, and to the end of the earth. Now that is your assignment. You know, are there many times that sometimes we feel like we are doing the, 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 the assignment of Christ and we might not be doing it? I'll just leave that question to you. Are there times that we are doing things that we think we are doing things of God and yet actually there are not assignments that God has for us? The work that the disciples were supposed to do, the assignment was to witness, to witness in the whole earth, to witness until the end of the ages. That was the sign. Not re-establishing a kingdom, an earthly kingdom, no. Not re-establishing leadership, no. The assignment was big. And if indeed the kingdom was to be restored, the kingdom was to be restored on the basis of the word of God. It was to be restored on the basis of you going out there and preaching the word of God. And the third area of preparation that they needed to do 
and that they have done very perfectly well is not only to reaffirm the promises of God, it's not only to reorient them on their assignment because their perspective of the assignment was not right, but it was also to replace Judas. They needed to replace Judas. This assignment is big. You need a full team for this assignment. You need a full team for this assignment. And so what is, what is uh, Peter doing in verse 15 of chapter 1? He says that in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of the names was about 120. Now, I want you to mark something here because it is going to form the basis of our lesson. There were 120 people and said, Peter is saying in verse 16, men and brethren, this scripture has to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was unnumbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Verse 18, now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all the entrails gushed out. Of course, you know what happened. He bought a, 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 a piece of shamba and then a kapasuka. That is the word. The, the simple one is alepasuka. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem so that the field is called in their own language Akel Dama, that is, field of blood. And then look at this. Peter alludes to scriptures and say, For it is written in the book of Psalm, Let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it. And let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have been accompanying us all the time that the Lord Jesus went out, out amongst us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two people. What was the name? Joseph, also called Bar Sabas, and, who, and, and, and Justus. Uh, who is also called martyrs. And of course, after that, the Bible says in verse 24, and they did what, church? What did they do? They prayed and said, You, O Lord, who knows the heart of all, show which of these two you have chosen. In verse 25, to take part in the ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. And they casted their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Amen. So the preparation number one is the reaffirmation of the promise that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will work in you. In fact, the reaffirmation came with a condition. You are supposed to stay in the upper room. You don't need to move. It is no time yet. You don't need to move. Stay in the upper room. When you stay in the upper room, the Holy Spirit will come. That was a promise of God. And because he is the enabler of this global mission and global ministry that is yet to start. But number two, you need to know the assignment. Get to know the assignment. The assignment is not the boundaries. The assignment is not the leadership. The assignment is not taking charge of this empire. The assignment is about witnessing about the resurrection, death, and life of Christ to the whole world. But number three, you need to prepare yourself by filling up your team. But there are some few things I want us to note about the way they did this. You know, this has a lot of leadership things in it. Number one, 
They identified the gap. Peter identified the gap. If you look at verse 15 to verse 19, he's talking about this uh, Judas, what Judas did, and you know, he, he sold, you know, he went with those who persecuted Christ, and now he's no longer, in fact, he's dead. In fact, he's not, he's not only dead, but he busted in a field somewhere. So there is a gap. They identified the gap. But number two, a beautiful thing in verse 20. What is happening in verse 20? Peter consulted the scriptures. Peter consulted the scriptures. You know, I looked at this. Um, I always tell people serving as a youth pastor needs a lot of balancing. And, and, and the reason why it needs a lot of balancing is, let me give you any practical examples in this congregation today. We start the year with Edu. Edu is here as our event leader. And then in, in, in May, he comes to my office and tells me, you know, Mimi Ntawa. And he makes it, na naawa, anakuacha hapo. So youth ministry, every single time, the pastor is thinking about replacements. Every single time. We started off when Masi Kwemoe was the discipleship leader. So easy, I may join ladies' ministry and the noble marriages. We started, I can mention, there are many. Praise the Lord. So we need to be replacing. And I was looking at the kind of replacement that is done in this book. Number one, there was an identification of the gap that was there. Number two, Peter consulted the scriptures. He wanted the scriptures to support whatever thing that he was doing. But not only that, look at number three. Peter gave options to the people. He did not settle on a single person. He gave options to the people. And how many people were they to choose from? 120 people. It, this was, these were the words. It is sometimes good to read the Bible and read it intently. These were the words. He said, Brothers and sisters, among these people who have been accompanying us all through since the baptism of John, one of them needs to be witness with us of what we have seen, which is the resurrection of Jesus and ascension of Jesus. So he, he gave options among the 120. But then, even the 120, he allowed the people to come up with the names of two. And when they got the names of two, what is he doing? He get the people to pray. He get the people to pray in verse 24 and 25. And you don't know the content of that prayer. Look at content. And they prayed and said, you, O oh Lord, who knows the heart of all, show which of these two you have chosen. Show us to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judah's transgression fell that he might go to his own place. Show us. And then after showing us, now they went into the democracy and participated in casting of the lots. But the process was long. The process was deep. The process was salvific. The process was deeply Christian in nature. The preparation that they needed to have made, number one, they needed to reaffirm the promises of God before this big global mission. Number two, they needed not only to reaffirm the promises, but they needed to know the assignment. They needed to be reoriented on the assignment. But number three, they needed to replace Judas and replace it in a way that gives God glory. But number four, which we are going to look at next week, they needed to wait for the coming of the promised Holy Spirit. So next week, we are looking at that. They needed to have waited for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, after all this have happened in the preparation, 
And as I've told you next week, we are now getting into them waiting for the Holy Spirit as part of their preparation. Then they now launch into the ministry. Let me highlight to you a little bit about the ministry that is awaiting these people so that you agree with me how global it is. We will start with the church in Jerusalem. So they will start in the church with the Jerusalem church. And in that church, we will look at the Pentecost, you know, the Holy Spirit coming. And then we will look at the reaction for the Holy Spirit coming. And then we are going to see this beautiful sermon that is preached by Pastor Paul. A beautiful sermon. And the way that sermon is going to change things. And that is why I think in the next two, three weeks, the title that we are giving to our Wednesday prayers is the church was founded by the Spirit and progressed by the Word. Because that sermon is what progressed the church. Then we look at the characteristics of the church. And then we'll also look at the struggle that the church of Jerusalem was having, both within and without. Then we will be looking at that struggle leading into the killing of Stephen, the climax of it. Now that will close the ministry of the apostles in Jerusalem. Then we cross border into the ministry of the apostles in the church in Palestine and Syria. What the Bible had alluded to before, Judea. And we look at the ministry that was done by Philip. We look at Paul or Saul being converted. We look at the ministry of Peter. We look at the church in Antioch, a new center of operation after Jerusalem. We look at God continuing to protect Jerusalem. And then we'll see a beautiful summary report of the church in chapter 12. I can't wait to see that report. And then we will also have closed the second phase of the church. I told you, these people are having a lot of work. And then now we get into the church, advancing to the end of the world. And in the end of the world, we'll be looking at, during Wednesday prayers, Wednesday services, we look at the first missionary journey. Who were involved? What was happening? How is it affecting us? We look at the council, what we are calling the Jerusalem Council, a council that, you know, is very impactful for us because in that council, that is the council that a decision was made that the gospel must also reach to the Gentiles, who you are and myself. You know, we look at the second missionary journey of Paul. We look at the third missionary journey. Then we look at Paul in Jerusalem. And when we see Paul in Jerusalem, we will finalize this book by now seeing Paul in Rome. We will see Paul shipwrecked. Paul in Malta. Paul getting into Rome in the hands of the oppressors. Then we will be bringing this book to an end. You can't just miss any Sunday, either online or practically, in person. Because we want to see the move of the church. And my prayer is that as we finish this study in the book of Acts, we will see where we are as a church or as a person. And where we are supposed to be. And we will see the move of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit working in the lives of these people, either in Jerusalem, in Syria, or Judea, and also to the ends of the earth in the missionary journeys. We will see the amazing working of God. Please purpose to be here. But first... Paul, uh, Peter, and the apostles needed to have been prepared. They needed to be, have a reaffirmation of the promise. They needed to get the assignment right. They needed not only to reaffirm the promise and get that assignment right, but they also needed to replace Judas so that it's a full team. But number four, which we are looking at next week, they needed to wait for the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit will work in them. And next week we are looking at how is the Holy Spirit working in us to advance the kingdom of God. God bless you and God be with you.